So it's my pleasure to introduce Mike McCloskey. Mike comes from the Cognitive Science Department at Johns Hopkins. Um, and uh, I was looking over Mike's CV. I don't need to make you guys feel bad because it took me a long time to get my PhD and to get a job. But Mike was 24 when he got his PhD and he started his job at Hopkins when he was 24 years old too. So he's a guy who doesn't mess around in grad school. Um, since that time he's worked on an awful lot of topics reading, spelling, memory, a lot of different visual perception. Um, I didn't realize in looking at his CD, he did a lot of work on eyewitness testimony of psychologists. Um, and for me, Mike's work is really characterized by a real thoroughness and thoughtfulness. I know whenever I see a paper uh, that comes out of his lab, it's gonna be a really excellent, high quality paper. And he also has a knack for finding some of the most interesting patients that have been reported. So I think you know, I first heard about the patient he's going to talk about it today, maybe six months ago, from reading his webpage. And I thought, this is the most, one of the most amazing patients I've ever heard of. And I thought, thought back, now, what's the, who's the most recent patient that's as amazing as this one? And I thought, well, I think it's got to be AH from Mike's work in the mid 90s, somebody who had visual mislocalization deficits. This is somebody who would so let's say something's on the right, she would perceive it to be on the left, or she would flip things horizontally as well. Um, anyway, I'll stop there and let Mike tell us about AVAD. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not going to present you a long integrated series of studies extending over years that comes to some grand conclusions. Rather, I'm going to tell you about a single patient study uh, with a very unusual deficit that I don't fully understand. And so since there are a lot of smart people here who know more about vision than I do, maybe you can, maybe you can help me interpret it. So if we think about visual awareness, there are a lot of intractable questions that we would love to have the answers to. Like, what is awareness? I mean, what is this about? What does it mean to be conscious or aware of something? How can neural tissue give rise to awareness? There's absolutely nothing as far as I can see that we can do to approach these questions right now. But there are some potentially tractable questions we can ask. Things like what cognitive and neural mechanisms may be implica implicated in awareness and what cognitive and neural processes can occur in the absence of awareness. I think some of the most intriguing evidence on points like this comes from brain damaged patients, and you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the phenomena of blind sight, which raises a lot of interesting uh, issues for these kinds of, of questions. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a single patient study that involves a very unusual deficit in perception of digits, especially, and also some letters. And I'm going to present some behavioral results and some ERP results as well. And then I'll talk very, in a very speculative vein about implications for understanding visual recognition and visual awareness. So the person I'll talk about, I'll call RFS. Uh, he is a 61-year-old left-handed man. He works as an engineering geologist, or did until he retired recently. Back in fall of 2010, he began to experience various cognitive and motor symptoms. And an MRI showed some cortical atrophy, especially in parietal regions. This is a, a single image here. This, I'm told by neurologists, is some atrophy, not necessarily severe atrophy, although it looks like there's a lot of empty space in his head to me. Uh, the diagnosis he was given, probably not as much as in my head, but you know, anyway, he was given a diagnosis of corticobasal degeneration, which is a neurodegenerative disease involving widespread uh, degeneration, including in the basal ganglia and, of course, in the, in the cortex. Uh, since that time, he's shown a considerable <coughs> progression in motor and somatosensory and memory deficits. So this is, this is a very cruel disease. Uh, he has problems like he first had a major tremor in one of his hands. Now that hand is essentially clenched and unusable. Uh, his muscles are tonically contracted, and so he's in a lot of pain from that. He has you know, poor control over his jaw muscles, so he's broken a number of teeth just trying to eat. And it's, it's, just, it's just a horrible thing. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about, though, is 
one aspect of this deficit which has to do with his visual perception. Now, if we test his visual perception, for the most part, we find that it seems perfectly normal. So his picture recognition seems fine. He can tell you that's a helicopter without any difficulty. He can make copies of either meaningful or nonsense shapes without difficulty. He does fine on identifying typographic symbols like the percent sign or the dollar sign or so forth. No difficulties at all. At the same time, though, he shows profoundly disturbed perception of digits, the Arabic digits like the eight here. And so just to, to show you this, let me contrast the letter B and the digit A. So he was asked to shown these, uh, shown these stimuli and just asked to make copies, not under any time pressure. And so here's the copy he drew of the B, which is perfectly reasonable. But when he was asked to copy the eight, this is what he drew. Okay? And what he said is that he sees some black lines and then the color in the background. In fact, I'll play you a little video clip of him doing this copying just so you can get a sense of you know, how he's going about it. And he says he can't exactly reproduce what it looks like. Uh, the lines may look like they're in different places when he looks you know, down and then looks up again. And it somehow just doesn't, it just looks wrong. But he's doing the best he can to. Feel free to come in and sit down. You don't have to worry about walking. Okay. So notice this doesn't look a whole lot like the, the target. And I think what people usually ask me is, is there some relationship between what he draws and the target? Like, is there a way that we could figure that, that that's an eight? Does he draw the eight like that every time? The answer is no. He will draw an eight a different ways, different times. Um, same for, for other digits. He certainly tried to work out whether he could identify the digits even though they didn't look the normal way to him because digits were crucial to him for his work. He uses math and numbers all the time in his, in his work, and this was a very serious problem for him. Uh, we were wondering whether if we made the stimulus big enough, maybe he was at least getting some low frequency information about the overall shape that might help him to identify it. Uh, not really. I'll uh, play you a little clip here just so you can see to what extent what he is seeing there does not really correspond very well to what's there. doesn't like looking at these because they look really wrong to him and, and really bad. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more about what goes on with the digits. First, interestingly enough, he doesn't have trouble with the digits 0 and 1. He seems to be perfectly normal in his perception and interpretation of those. We're not entirely sure why. They're among the simplest visual forms among the digits. Perhaps it has something to do with that. 0 and 1 also resemble letters, like the 0 resembles an O. That could be relevant. We, we don't really know. For the digits 2 through 9, however, he shows catastrophic impairment in any way you can imagine. He's unable to name them, uh, as you kind of see. He's unable to understand them. He has no idea which digit you're showing him. Uh, you've seen that he's unable to copy them. 
even he is unable to trace them if we give him the digit and just ask him to trace over it he's completely unable to do that so the the ballpoint pen line there is his attempt to trace over the the figure in this stimulus here and you know he said i don't i can't i just see a bunch of lines he refers to what the digits look like as spaghetti he says it looks like just a bunch of spaghetti you know lines of spaghetti he is also unable to write the digits. He says that he doesn't remember what they look like anymore, so he's unable to write them. And he even shows deficits in what Milner and Goodale would call vision for action tasks in which he is reaching for them. So I'll play you a little video clip here in which he's reaching for foam or metal letters or digits. And remember that he is okay with the digits zero and one, it's just the it's just the other one. And so his task here is simply to reach out and touch it. Right. So one is fine. And he really hated doing that because the way it feels and the way it looks don't match up at all. That, he found that very disturbing. Is he, is he normal in all the dimensions for zero and one? I mean, all those dimensions you just yes. showed? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you ask him to draw a zero, draw a one. He can write zeros and ones just fine. He, he, knows, he knows the meaning. He, uh, he tried to find various workarounds for his problem, uh, one of which was to try to do some of his numerical and math work with Roman numerals. and. You know, there are very good reasons we don't use Roman numerals for math. <laughs> he also tried binary, so the zeros and ones. He, you know, he could do that, but it's, a, again, not too convenient, you know, when you, if you're dealing with 100, you have a lot of digits well, there, so. Like two ones, yeah. like 11. He's okay with that, as, as long, and he knows the meaning of absolutely, yeah. yes. It's just the digit symbols, two through nine, yeah. Can he match? No, I'll, I'll show you that a little bit later. He cannot match. All right, so more generally, it's not a general numerical or mathematical deficit. Uh, he's intact in processing of number words, like the word seven. He's able to use Roman numerals without any difficulty. His mathematical skills are intact as long as we test him without Arabic numerals. And he you know, is routinely continuing to do the sophisticated math that he needs to do for his work. So uh, he was, for example, in the 91st percentile on the WACE arithmetic subtest. It's a verbal uh, arithmetic test, so um, it doesn't require visual symbols. And interestingly, we found that he was able to learn and use novel digit symbols. So I'm going to call these surrogate digits. We created a new set of digit symbols for him, both for research purposes, but also an attempt at uh, compensation for him. So the way these were constructed is they all had a vertical stroke, which didn't have any value, and a horizontal stroke at the bottom had a value of 2, one in the middle a value of 4, one at the top a value of 8, and a little flag on the left had a value of 1. And so this was the surrogate digit for 5. It has the 4 line and the 1 flag here. And this is the whole set of them. So basically we just gave these to him and see if he could learn them, and he very readily learned them. One thing we wondered was maybe he would be able to do, deal with them okay at first, but as he learned them as having numerical meaning, then maybe he would then be unable to see them too. They would become spaghetti. They did not. He's been using these for several years now to do all his numerical and math work, and they continue to be uh, perfectly well perceived. So we uh, modified the fonts on his computer so that when he uh, is displaying numbers, they display 
in these new surrogate digits, which he's, he's able to interpret. Uh, we created a calculator app for him uh, so that he can do his math and these. I'll play you again a little video clip of him, of him uh, using this. 13 times um, I'm saying mm -hmm, I have no idea whether he's right or not, but I, I checked it later. So this was good, both that we found that he could learn these, but he did also say he was able to continue working for longer because he had this, this substitute system to use. And he uses it all the time at home. If you go visit him at home, he's got phone numbers written down and this, and so that's just the way he does, does numbers now. All right, let's talk about letters briefly. For most letters, his performance seems normal, perception, identification, writing, and so forth seem okay. Uh, so, for example, I already showed you a copy of the letter B. In this task, he was given this outline and just asked to trace around it. He did a perfectly good job of that. However, there is a subset of letters, M, N, P, R, S, and Z, and again, I don't know why these particular letters, uh, but he has some difficulty with these. You know, he wondered, well, maybe those are the ones that most closely resemble digits, but I really don't think that holds up too well, so again, we don't know why these. So for these, he shows moderate perceptual distortion, nothing like for the digits, but definite, definite distortion. So here, for example, is what happened when he was asked to trace over the outline of the Z, and he's perfectly satisfied with this. He, think he thinks he's got it exactly right. Uh, he has occasional difficulty recognizing these letters. He complains that he has some trouble in reading. He hates the word minimum, for example, because it's got lots of M's and N's in it. Uh, and so one thing we did, we, we uh, pairs of letters that he has difficulty distinguishing in the new fonts, we put additional marks on those to help him help distinguish those. And he finds that to be helpful. He has some difficulty writing these as well. Okay. So let me give you an example of this, again, to see there really is a perceptual distortion here. So I'll show you three little clips uh, with the letter P. First, he's tracing over it, and then uh, we're doing a few other things with it. He is left-handed, but at some point the tremor in his left hand got to be bad enough that he had to use his right hand. So he complains a little bit about using his right hand. He's not quite as precise with it. So when he mentions that, that's what he's talking about. There's also some other stuff going on in the background here, so I apologize. There's a little extra noise on this clip. Let's follow up on something just a little bit from the last time. You had eight points, right? Okay. Trace around the other one, So even when he has his finger right there, like in the area these traced as being in the interior, where his finger is right there on the white paper, he says it's gray. That's what he's seeing. And when it's outside of where he's traced, even when it's part of the character in gray, he says it's white. So it really looks like he's seeing it differently than, than it's there. Still looks like a P that he's pretty traced over. Okay, I'm going to cover part of it. Remember, he has no trouble with D. Does it look different now? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Okay. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
he likes to experiment a little himself. Uh, so what what looks different? When I look at just this thing, mm -hmm. I, I should have been out here mm -hmm. with the line. Mm -hmm. cool, cool, cool. Mm -hmm. stops looking the same or changes? So this particular visual shape, the shape of the P, for some reason he misperceives the shape of it. When we modify the shape by making it so it no longer looks like a P, then he perceives it perfectly accurately. My, my kid's misperceptions as you were covering the stem seemed to be consistent. I mean, he was seeing this, having the same misperception. Yes. And if you showed him the P the next day? He wouldn't necessarily it. trace it exactly the same way, but it would probably be distorted. Yes, okay. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. yeah. So our best guess is this is a milder form of the deficit seen with digits. Now that's not much of an explanation since I haven't told you what the problem with the digits is yet. And you'll probably still be waiting for that at the end of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's go back to, to the digits. In addition to there being impaired perception of the digits themselves, for RFS, the digits also <coughs> impair perception of other stimuli that are nearby in space or time. So let's just look at space first. So here we show him a digit on a grid, and the digit looks like spaghetti to him. But he also says that the, di the, the grid looks distorted in the neighborhood of the spaghetti. And the line he's drawn around there uh, is to indicate the approximate boundaries of where the grid looks distorted. He said the lines look wavy or they look, look bent in some way. But probably more useful, here's a task where there's a line drawing, Snodgrass and van der Waart line drawing, with some semi-transparent characters superimposed over it. <coughs> so in one condition, the characters were digits in the range 2 through 9, which he is, you know, cannot identify. In the other condition, they were zeros and ones or letters that he doesn't have any trouble with. Okay, and the task, he didn't have to do anything with the characters. The task was simply to identify the picture. So when the overlaying characters were digits two through nine, he was never able to identify the picture, and he just, his typical answer was, I have no idea. Uh, he said occasionally he would see a little line segment or something, but it didn't cohere into a picture for him. On the other hand, when these were characters he didn't have any difficulty with, he was 100% correct. The task was, was very straightforward for him. Here's another variant of this. Instead of overlaying the uh, pictures, we just put them inside a big character. So in one condition, a picture was inside digits in the two through nine range. And again, no idea even that there was a picture there, uh, much less you know, where it was or what it was. So he was un completely unable to do it. Yet, again, when they were characters that he was able to perceive and identify, he had no difficulty with the task at all. 
and more generally, uh, anything in the spatial vicinity. So if we put a picture, well, not there because he can see it. If we put a picture here, he's likely to have difficulty with it. It is spatially determined. If we move it further away from the digit, then he becomes able to, to see it. This task looks at lingering effects in time of viewing digits. And so in this task, he first viewed what I'll call a pre-mask uh, for two seconds. In this example, it's made up of a bunch of twos. Then there was a variable ISI, and then there was a letter target presented for 200 milliseconds. This was always a letter that he had no difficulty identifying. And the dependent variable here is target letter accuracy. So we're just looking at how well he is able to identify the letter. The pre-mask was either one of the digits that he has difficulty perceiving, digits two through nine, or it was a character that he doesn't have difficulty with, zeros or ones or, or hash marks. Okay. When the pre-mask was a character that he can process without any difficulty, he was fine on identifying the target character regardless of the ISI. I think he made one error at 250 milliseconds, otherwise he was perfect. When the pre-mask was a digit in the two through nine range, on the other hand, his performance was dramatically worse. He was completely unable, he never identified the character correctly with a 250 or 500 millisecond ISI, and even after a second, he was not even 10% correct not until two or three seconds did his performance approach the control condition range. Now what he says is that in this experimental situation or just in other less formally, if he's looked at digits and then they're taken away, whatever, was, whatever is there now looks wrong or looks distorted for a few seconds afterwards. So there's some lingering effect in time. Okay, what may be going on here? Well, the short answer is I'm not entirely sure, but I'll take a, take a shot at it anyway. So when we process visual information for recognition, there are lots of different types of stimuli we deal with. We deal with objects, pictures of objects, we deal with characters, we deal with faces, which some people consider to be mildly interesting stimuli around here. We deal with scenes, all sorts of things. So. Presumably, all of these types of stimuli have to undergo some initial perceptual processing to generate some sort of representation that can drive recognition. And I'll talk about this very vaguely as perceptual processing and say that, that generates some kind of form representation, specifying shape, color, texture, whatever, you know, whatever is appropriate for the particular stimulus. And then there are lots of reasons, behavioral and um, neural for believing that there is specialization of higher level recognition mechanisms. There are specialized mechanisms for recognizing faces, for recognizing objects, for recognizing characters, presumably. And so that if the appropriate type of stimulus is presented, that recognition process will come into play. So for example, if we're recognizing characters, uh, if you're shown a digit eight and you are not RFS, you will generate some kind of basic shape representation for that, which will be interpreted by the character recognition process and presumably will activate a stored representation of the digit eight and then that will constitute recognition. Now, if within this very simple framework we try to make sense of RFS's deficit, we can see there's a basic problem here, almost a paradox. So the deficit is on the one hand perceptual Yet, on the other hand, it's also domain specific, affecting just digits and a few letters. And so, just to, to develop that idea, the distorted perceptions would seem to suggest a perceptual processing deficit. The fact that he is not seeing these things the way they really look suggests that something probably is going wrong early in the process where a form representation is being generated. So that on this account, uh, when he looks at, say, a five, the disordered perceptual processes generate some spaghetti like that. Now, 
The problem with that is, is pretty obvious. We wouldn't expect a deficit of this sort to be restricted to digits in certain letters. Uh, we would expect, presumably, that other objects, simple shapes, certainly other characters like the B would show similarly disordered perceptual processing. There's no reason to believe that this early perceptual processing prior to recognition would be so specific that it could affect the category of digits or would be specific in such a way that it could affect digits and not, not other things. So the fact that the impairment is limited to digits and letters suggests, on the other hand, that maybe there's a character recognition deficit so that perhaps when an eight is presented, uh, the perceptual processing is intact, but then something goes wrong in character recognition such that the appropriate representation is not activated. And this sort of deficit certainly does occur. I mean, we've studied a number of patients who, when they look at a letter or a digit, are often unable to identify it. However, in this sort of deficit, the individual knows exactly what the shape looks like. They just don't know what the identity of it is. So they can copy it, they can describe the shape, they can match it, and so forth and so on. Yet this is not what's happening with RFS. So it doesn't look like this kind of typical character recognition deficit. And so I would say that a character recognition deficit at least doesn't straightforwardly explain the distorted perception of the characters, and especially, I would say, of the nearby stimuli. So one possible way of resolving this paradox is to refer to the notion of recurrent processing or feedback within the visual system. A number of theorists have suggested for various reasons that feedback plays a crucial role in perceptual processing, but also in phenomenological perceptual experience. Uh, so within the way I've been talking about it, we could imagine that there is feedback from the recognition processes back to the earlier perceptual level, perhaps among other levels as well. And on some of these hypotheses, you know, normal feedback is going to be consistent with the early visual representations. If this character is identified as an eight, the feedback is going to be consistent with the shape that gave rise to it to begin with. Uh, and on some accounts, this actual full loop of feed forward and feedback is necessary to give rise to awareness. That in the absence of this full loop of processing here, you may have implicit processing, implicit recognition, but not awareness. And this has been proposed, among other reasons, to account for some backward masking phenomenon. And of course, I think more generally, the the notion of involvement of both the lower level and the higher level representations in awareness fits with the, the observation that what we're aware of is not anything like raw perceptual information, but it's interpreted in, in some way. But we are aware of the visual stimulus as well. So just to, to take some fairly trivial examples, uh, has anyone not seen this before? Probably everyone has seen this a million times, right? OK, when you first saw it, unless you immediately recognized the dog, you probably saw it as a bunch of black and white dots. But I would wager that you can't see it that way anymore. You can't help but see the dog there. So the interpretation that you originally ri arrived at and presumably have stored some information about is affecting what you're seeing. You can't help but see the interpretation of, of dog there as well. And of course, I love these things too, which you've probably already seen. Uh, maybe not these particular examples. So these produce compelling 3D percepts here, right? But of course, all they are are two-dimensional drawings on the sidewalks. They are simply drawn so that if they are viewed from a particular perspective, they project to the retina as if they were 3D scenes. and the the visual system compellingly interprets them that way. And you can't help but perceive them that way. And so just in case you haven't seen these before, this is a photo taken from the right perspective. This is what the drawing 
actually looks like. Okay? Even though you know what they are, you can't help but see them in these interpretive ways. But anyway, to get back to the, get back to the main point, if we think about feedback being important for your awareness or how you experience a visual stimulus, then a disorder affecting the feedback could presumably affect how you perceive the stimulus, perhaps other things. So the suggestion here is that perhaps in RFS there is disordered feedback from character recognition such that you don't have this nice uh, mutually reinforcing consistent loop where the perceptual information is consistent with the character recognition, the feedback from character recognition is consistent with the perceptual representation. And so I'll uh, illustrate this here by a line. You can tell that the feedback is, is distorted here or, or abnormal because the line is squiggly and it's in red. And that's about the most interpretation you're going to get of what it means for the feedback to be, to be bad. And so on this hypothesis then, the result is distorted visual awareness for the character and perhaps other things in the same spatial or temporal vicinity. Now, the disordered feedback could have one of at least two effects. One is that it could disrupt, it could kind of go back and kill the early perceptual representation so that perhaps you are seeing something or RFS is seeing something disordered because the feedback has actually disrupted the perceptual representation. Another possibility though is that awareness may be disrupted even though the initial perceptual representation is intact and even though the character recognition may be intact. And I'm actually going to suggest that's probably the more likely possibility. All right. So this may be intact and this may be intact. All right, so this all raises the possibility that despite the lack of awareness, RFS may implicitly recognize the digits themselves and the nearby stimuli. So we decided to try to see if we could find any evidence for implicit recognition. And I'll first tell you about a set of completely unsuccessful experiments uh, we used several behavioral tasks, forced choice tasks that probed implicit recognition of the digits themselves or stimuli embedded in them. And so the rationale was that forced choice responding might reveal implicit knowledge that RFS wasn't aware of having. And so the question we'll be looking at with these tasks is would he show above chance performance even in the absence of awareness? So the first task he was shown a single digit and just had to say whether it was even or odd. And of course he says, I can't see the digits. Uh, you know, what do you mean? It's just all spaghetti. And we said, well, you just have to guess anyway. Just kind of like the blind sight patient who says, I can't see the light. And the examiner says, point to it anyway. You know, it's just like, let the force be with you and, uh, <laughs> you know, point. Our control condition here was the surrogate digits where we, of course, expect him to perform well since he really easily knows what those are. Then there were several tasks with stimuli embedded in the digits. Uh, square versus diamond was one of them, either in a digit in the range two through nine or in a letter that he can perceive. This is the control condition again. Uh, plus versus time symbol, up versus down arrow. This is on the assumption if something is worth doing, it's worth doing to excess. And we also used things that were a little less uh, direct. So here there were pictures that were either musical instruments or vehicles. He had just to guess which of those. And finally there were words, uh, either animal words like cat or object words like bed, and he was forced to guess which was which. Okay. So first for the control conditions where he was able to see the characters and the embedded stimuli, as one would hope, you don't have to read all of this stuff. Uh, the bottom line is he was virtually perfect at this as we would have hoped to see. The conditions where we were looking for implicit recognition, however, uh, across all of these, he was just as close to chance as you can possibly be. 166 out of 330 or 165 is exactly 50% correct. So there's no evidence for any implicit recognition there. 
this will address a question that came up earlier. We also did some same different tasks where he was shown pairs of digits and he simply had to say same or different, physically same or different. And we also asked him to say same or different for an Arabic numeral shown visually versus a spoken numeral. And what we found is that when the decision could be made using the zeros and ones, which he could see, like if he had two versus one, he can't see the two, but he knows it's got to be a digit larger than one because it looks like spaghetti. He was perfectly able to do that. He was 100% correct on those. But when the digits required him to identify process digits in the two through nine range, he was completely at chance on those. So even when the task was simply to say, are these two stimuli physically identical? He was unable to do it. Okay. All right, so the behavioral tasks don't provide any evidence of implicit recognition. But we didn't give up at this point. We decided to try some ERP studies, the rationale being that ERP might reveal implicit recognition even though the behavioral tasks didn't. So we know that there are certain ERP components that reflect processing distinguishing between faces and non-face stimuli, the N170, and stimuli designated as targets versus non-targets, the P300. And so what we tried to do is use these components to probe for cognitive processing in the absence of awareness. And in these studies, we were looking at stimuli that were embedded in the digits rather than the digits themselves. So the first experiment used the N170, which, as you probably know, refers to increased negativity to face stimuli approximately 170 milliseconds after stimulus onset. We don't know exactly what the N170 indicates. There's considerable debate about that, but we do know that it distinguishes at least face from non-face stimuli. And so the control here were faces versus just scrambled up face images. So in one condition, the face or the non-face stimulus was shown embedded in a character that he can identify and perceive normally. So here he can see the face, he can see the scrambled up image there. And so we expected to see an N170 there, even though it's not a typical type of stimulus presentation. In the other condition, the face or the scrambled up face was embedded in a digit that he can't see. And for these stimuli, he says, you know, of course, it just looks like spaghetti. What do you mean there's a face there? I don't see anything else there. He has no idea whether there's a face or not a face, he says. And so the question was whether he would show an N170 when the faces and scrambled faces are embedded in digits. Uh, here's a graduate student, David Rothline, uh, modeling the, the electrode net. And here are the results. So these are results from two occipital electrodes, first for the control condition here, where the face or scrambled face is in a character he can see. And the blue tracing is for the stimuli that included a face, the red is for the scrambled face, and the, using the convention of negative being up. And so you can see we see a significant N170 in this condition um, on these electrodes. The face gives you a higher negative uh, potential than the, the non-faces. All right, the interesting result, though, is that we get exactly the same thing when the faces and scrambled faces are embedded in these digits that he can't see. Uh, we get a perfectly good N170, even though he says he can't see the faces, he has no idea whether it's a face or a scrambled face. So the neural activity is distinguishing faces from scrambled faces even in the absence of awareness. The second experiment used a similar logic but with the P300. This is an increased positivity to stimuli that have been designated as targets around 250 to 500 milliseconds post onset. And these usually have to be um, infrequent targets as well. So they're just indicators of processing that in some way distinguishes the target from the non-target stimuli. And here we used words as the target stimuli and the non-targets. So in the control condition, these words were embedded in characters, large characters like the E here that he was able to perceive without difficulty. Uh, two of the words, 
tuba and fife were designated as targets. Uh, they're slightly strange words because we, we selected all the stimuli to avoid any of the letters that he had difficulty with. And those made up 20% of the trials. Uh, the remaining 80% of the trials were other words that were non-target stimuli. All right, so that's the control condition. The digit condition was exactly the same, except the words were now embedded in digits that he is unable to see. And so here, of course, he says he can't see the words. He has no idea there are words there, doesn't know what any of the letters are, of course, and has no idea what the whole word is. So again, we're looking to see whether he'll show a P300 when the target and non-target words are embedded in digits. And OK, first the control condition. The, we're looking for a positive deflection now. So for the targets, this is the P300 here, as expected. Stronger positive response to tuba and fife than to the others. And here is when they were embedded in digits. Again, we get a perfectly good, very strong P300 for these words that he is completely unaware of. So again, the neural activity is distinguishing the target from the non-target words even in the absence of awareness. We don't know exactly to what level he's processed these target stimuli, but it has to be you know, reasonably good to reasonably high level to the extent that he is distinguishing those targets from all the other words that were presented. All right, so the ERP results then do demonstrate implicit processing of the stimuli embedded in the digits, despite his lack of awareness. So that when we presented the face to the non-face, even though he couldn't see those stimuli, we get an N170 to the face stimuli. Even though he is not aware of the words here, he is responding more to the target words with the P300. So, what is going on here? Uh, what we're thinking then is that when the stimuli are presented, uh, we get good perceptual representations of them. And we're getting activation of the character, the appropriate character and character recognition. If you think about it, there has to be some level of recognition for these digits in order for them to behave differently from all the other stimuli. So as he said to us, I have to be seeing them in order not to see them. I mean, he's, he's, he has a pretty good understanding of what's going on. And the face is also getting processed to some degree. We don't know exactly how much here. But the disordered feedback is disrupting awareness of what's going on despite this perceptual processing. Now, this experiment with the faces also speaks a bit to the question of whether the disordered feedback is actually disrupting the perceptual representation or whether the perceptual representation is uh, remaining intact and only the awareness is disrupted. It turns out the way we did this experiment is that we first presented the digit alone on each trial and after one second the face or the scrambled face was added to it. And so the digit itself had a one second head start, which is plenty of time for it to become all scrambled up. So if what we're going on here is that the perceptual representation was generated, then there was character recognition, then there was feedback, and it caused this terrible thing to happen at the perceptual level, one would expect, I think, that when the face was then added, it would be disrupted by the bad feedback coming in as well, and you would never get a good perceptual representation of the face. Instead, what seems to be happening, what I think is most likely, is that even though you have this head start and you have the bad feedback here, when the face is then added, the perceptual representation has not di been disrupted, and you can add you know, the perceptual representation of the face to this, allowing the face then to be processed. So that at least seems to me to be the more likely of the possibilities. All right, so to conclude then, brain damage can result in domain-specific disruptions of visual awareness. And at least I don't see any straightforward way to explain this with feed-forward processing. The disordered feedback provides at least a potential interpretation 
although obviously this needs to be developed much farther. And the awareness can be disrupted despite intact generation of perceptual representations and intact activation of the stored representations. I have not been able to find much in the way of literature showing similar deficits. However, there is one type of other impairment that may be relevant here, and that is so-called face metamorphopsia or prosopometamorphopsia, if you like the really long terms. And this is perceptual distortion that is selective to faces. Uh, reported as early as, early as Bodimer's original study on prosopagnosia and some more recent cases that involve things like part of the face seeming to be melted like a Dali painting, as, as one of the patients described it. And so this poses the same sort of challenge, I think. Why do you get what looks like perceptual distortion and not merely, say, failure of recognition in the presence of intact perception, but specific to faces? And conceivably, what we're seeing there is bad feedback from some face recognition mechanism. It's interesting that most of these cases that I'm aware of seem to be associated with seizure disorder, either documented seizure disorder or at least showing uh, the effect went away when the person was treated with anti-epileptic medications. RFS does not have any kind of seizure disorder, so that's not what's, not what's going on for him, but this seems conceptually similar. All right, let me finally thank the many people who helped on this. I particularly want to acknowledge David Rothline, Teresa Schubert, graduate students in cognitive science, both of whom are in, in postdocs right now, and a number of other colleagues in, in neurology and cognitive science and medical psychology. So thank you very much. <laughs>
this worsen over time? And would you expect more letters to get involved or bigger spaces? Yeah, really, really good question. So we first saw him, I guess, about nine months after this started. And at that point, what he was saying to us is that the problem with the digits came on pretty suddenly over a couple of weeks that during that period they would sometimes look distorted and sometimes not and then they were just distorted. He feels that the problems with the letters were a little bit later of onset. The only thing we've seen during the time we were testing him is that he one of the letters that he now has trouble with, I think the P, he was not having trouble with when we initially started. But other than that, uh, nothing has changed with the letters and digits. Um, he is reporting that he feels like his, his ability to do like addition and multiplication in his head has gotten worse. Uh, his memory problems have gotten a bit worse, but his cognition is much more intact than his somatosensory and motoric stuff at this point. I would guess at some point uh, that there will be further deterioration, and you know, although for his sake I don't want to see it, it will be interesting to see if this, this condition evolves in some way. It might give us additional clues as to what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, Patrick? Uh, wow. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, the, uh, well, a couple of things. First, the specificity of the separate letters, you must have thought through you know, equivalent things like the fruit and vegetable man and that have these localized losses. Mm -hmm. uh, are there other uh, Alexia examples of people who have lost specific letters in reading and maybe not so dramatic as this person? But yes. Um, most of the time when people study patients with alexias or agraphias, they don't look at it in all that much detail. But over the past several years, we've been studying three people with more typical letter identification deficits and accumulating a lot of evidence about how they perform with individual letters. And there are definite regularities in their performance, like they tend to confuse letters that are visually similar with one another. But there are also very big differences among individual letters in their accuracy. There are some letters that they almost never misidentify, and other letters they're horrible at. And that differs across the patient. So there may just be sort of some, I don't want to say random, but some you know, arbitrary aspect to the damage that will affect some letters more than others. So would you entertain, or have you already entertained and thrown out the idea that, in fact, recognition, not just for letters, but for objects and faces, is quite parcellated, that there could be a few letters here and other letters here, and that that might be randomly organized from person to person, so these patients could have these losses? That's possible. I guess I'd be more inclined to think, and I'm not sure that I can defend it, that the areas are, that there is localization, so localization of where the letters are, or maybe the letters and digits together. But when there's damage to those areas, the damage is not you know, all or none. It may be such that if you damage that area, whatever has happened, whatever neural loss you had, or whatever loss of connectivity, or whatever kind of disruption it is, it is just such that it affects some of them more than others. I don't think we necessarily have to assume that each letter or each digit is in a separate place, and some of them get hit or some of them don't. But you know, I, I'm not sure that we know enough about neural implementation yeah. of these things to, to but be also making confidence. Do you show any similarities in shape that would make sense to anyone who has a sort of shape based letter? But the second question is um, I think when you say that the, I mean, the effects being localized in space uh, suggest that it's not some feedback to an early level rather than calling it perceptual, call it, let's say, early. In fact, perhaps the early and the recognition both project to some theater of consciousness, let's say. <laughs> and and somehow the, the distorted letter projection is actually changing the nature of space representation, and that seems to be what you were saying. Um, so where would that special place be that those two conjoin? Probably the pineal gland. That's what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I, no. <laughs> 
I really, I really don't know. I mean, the, the only other clue that I have is that we did some frame of reference experiments with the temporal distortion. So if we show him digits and then have him saccade and then show him something else, does he have trouble at the same retinal location or the same what most people call spatiotopic location? And it's definitely the same spatiotopic location. So it's suggesting it's not a really, really uh, early okay, level. Yeah, it's some, something reasonably high. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, Peter. Coordinate systems. There's, there's, um, do you think this is happening in your center coordinates or something? So there's quite a few numbers that if you turn them upside down, with like a letter or vice versa, like a small a that's going upside down four or Mm -hmm. reverse E or seven or something like that. Right. I mean, for some of these, if you had such pairs and you turn the paper upside down, would you? Yeah, we did, we did some work with changing the orientations of digits, not specifically to, to make them look like letters, but I can tell you a couple of things. So digits that do look differently when they're inverted, if we invert them, I would say about half the time he is able to perceive the shape even though he can't identify it as a particular digit. So if we take a three and you know rotate it 90 degrees, he can see the shape, although he doesn't know that it's a, that it's a three. Uh, sometimes it still looks distorted. And, and if you keep doing it, like there's one time we, we were doing this with a three. You know, we turn it and you could see the shape, turn it back. And after we did it a couple of times, even when it was inverted, you say, now it's tainted, you know, I, I, it looks bad even when it's turned. So apparently it was getting recognized as a digit even though it was inverted. The other thing is, you, you may remember those big foam letters that he was having to touch. We did give him a big eight just to feel, to see if maybe the, the um, tactile information would help him see it better. And it definitely did. But one of the interesting things that happened while he was doing that, you know, he's holding it upright. It just looks totally wrong to him. He turned it on its side, the eight, and then he said, oh, now it looks like a mask. And so, you know, because like it has the two holes in it. So he could see the, he could see the shape. And then he turned it back upright and it became spaghetti again. So the orientation is relevant. Uh, is somebody going to give me the answer to this after I answer all <laughs> this question? Yeah, sorry, you had your hand um, up. I guess you kind of touched on this when you did the implicit perception task, but I'm kind of interested in like whether there's a difference between like global and local perception, and even with the face inside like the eight task that he had, like you still see like the lines around the eight, right? But what if you turned it into like a totally global versus local task? So you have like an eight, but it's composed of like little ones or little zeros that the person right. can actually read. Right. Like, that have any that still know? looks like spaghetti to him. Like even okay. if you have the, but can he identify like the little letters that he can identify? No, okay. it's no, that's it. It's like the picture going away. The individual characters. If you do it the other way around, that you have a big mm -hmm. G made of eights, right. uh, he can see the global form even though he can't identify the the individual characters. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if you, let's say, change the contrast of the digit from like really low contrast, so mm -hmm. does, does he have different sensitivity for those digits he can recognize versus the zero one? So if we're just looking at ability to detect whether something is there, mm -hmm. that's a good question. We haven't done that. We have done things like just manipulate various things like if it's high contrast versus low contrast, if it's moving, if it's flickering, if it's brief. None of that seems to help him. But no, I don't know if his detection uh, threshold would be different for digits than for, yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to it. Mm -hmm. um, did you, with your implicit test, did you ever look at whether expectation mattered at all? So if you say, you know, something like one plus one equals, and then he has to find, you know, decide if it's the two or the nine. If he's, if he's doing a visual search that's top down, where right, he's looking for a particular form, does that change anything? Uh, does he remember what a two looks like? He says that he does not remember what a two looks like. I mean, obviously, yeah, obviously he remembers what a two looks like, yeah, right? Yeah, not yeah, consciously, yeah, exactly. but no, he says he doesn't remember what the shape looked like. I mean, we had a really interesting little conversation with him where I said to him, 
figure eight. You know what a figure eight is, like an ice skating stuff. They said, yeah, sure, I know what a figure eight is. And then we said, okay, well, you know, tell us about it, draw it. And then he found that he was unable to do it. Uh, so I don't know if that really gets to your question. We have tried doing various sorts of things with him. You're wondering whether if we create an expectation of a particular character, yep. so, or even if, let's, let's, um, you know, let's be blunt about it and just say, this is an eight, can you see it? Well, that doesn't, that doesn't yeah, help at all. That's, okay. that's still bottom up in some way, right? I'm, I'm wondering if he generates the representation first or draws it up from memory. Oh, I see. Um, and then is doing a visual trip, because then he has the spatial template of where he's Right, going. right. Um, he is unable to do that, yeah. at least at a conscious level. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's lost the memory of the form of these numbers. He's lost the awareness of the, the form of the, the yes, right. that's, yeah. yes, that's right. right. Yeah, yes. And so uh, I would have to assume that this kind of feedback, whenever he's trying to process those forms, something is going wrong. Yeah. Would you be satisfied if I said I don't know? <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't have a good sense of exactly what this feedback is doing. You know, there are various ways of thinking about it, thinking about it in terms of predictive coding and error signals and stuff like that, or just as a way of trying to make sure everything fits together, or as a way of focusing attention on some aspects of the perceptual representation or so forth. And none of those particular ways of thinking about it, if, if I'm understanding your question, um, lead me to very specific predictions about what exactly should be affected. Should it be just the particular stimulus? Should it be the spatial area around it? I don't know. It's more that I'm saying, well, I could imagine that things in the spatial or temporal vicinity should be affected. But it, it does have a little bit of the feel, kind of going back to the face metamorphopsia, of kind of the, dis the disruption you could get from seizure activity, you know? So something is going wrong there that's, that's something bad is happening that's causing things to get disrupted. And I wish I had a better notion of it. I also wish that I could think of some way to start to try to get at this with neurotypical individuals so that, you know, I don't have to just try to go find somebody else who has this sort of impairment because they're not thick on the ground. Yeah. Why, why not try bilateral TMSing of normal people, like Pascal Leone does, in IPS, and see if you can recruit this in normal, you know, with our time? Yeah, something like that would be worth a try. I mean, it would be kind of a, a fishing expedition because I don't have any particular reason to suspect IPS, I don't think. Well, uh, that's where magnitudes are. It's not necessarily, this is about the digit symbols, I think, and not about. So, you know, I'd be more, I'd be more inclined to look at, at ventral, occipital, temporal cortex. Yeah. Uh, just in terms of connections to neurotypical people, when, when you showed those first drawings of his, they kind of reminded me of Ruth Rosenholz's texture tiling model from MIT, which is a model of the way that peripheral vision works in uh -huh. normal observers, mm -hmm. the idea that rather than seeing the exact locations of edges, you are collecting summary statistics pooled across sort of a larger region. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I don't know mm -hmm. if you had thought about whether it's possible these are like stati somehow statistically valid representations of the letters that are scrambled in some way, some information has been lost, but the edges are still there. Yeah, I, I think you put your finger on a very interesting question, which is nothing I've talked about addresses why the disrupted perception takes the particular form that it does. And it has some interesting properties, like he perceives black lines even when there are no black lines. That orange letter didn't have any black lines in it. And you know, I, I thought for a long time that we just gave him a black marker, so he was drawing with the black marker. But he said, no, there are black lines. And he sees edges even if we take, you know, apply a Gaussian blur, a pretty strong Gaussian blur 
to the digit so that it's quite fuzzy. He still sees the lines there and he draws them. And then this business of seeing the color separated from the form, the color just being in the background, it raises a lot of interesting questions. And yeah, one possibility is that it's a different kind of mode where statistics of some kind are being collected. And like crowding uh, tubes in a way that right. nearby mm -hmm. artifacted. Yeah. And that, that might be one possible avenue to go with with neurotypical individuals, see what we could get with crowding. I mean, I always thought that, that what goes on in the periphery is, is pretty weird. Uh, that's as technical as I can uh, get about it. Uh, so yeah, I, mean, I wonder also whether we're seeing for some reason awareness of some pretty raw perceptual information that you have color one place, you have contour other places. Probably not exactly that because you might expect then at least the contours will be in the right places. So yeah, I don't know. But Patrick has the answer for me. Okay. Exactly. Have you looked at um, uh, pop out in the search for digits to nine among letters, a bit like they do with synesthetes? Yeah, we tried a little bit of that with him. I'm trying to remember exactly what happens. He he doesn't have any trouble detecting whether a digit is there because it looks so weird to him. Yeah. These things so look. Does it pop out? Does it it pop out? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I. I know that we tried to do something with that. My guess is, since I don't remember it, either it's just you know early onset dementia, which is quite possible, <laughs> uh, or that for some reason it didn't work out technically. He's, it's difficult to do anything requiring reaction timing with him because of the motor difficulty. He's very slow. So it may be that we just weren't able to get reaction time data that we were comfortable with from him. But yeah, that, that would definitely be a important thing to I me. Think we could probably go on with questions all yeah. night. <laughs> sure. All right. Why don't we stop there. Well, we can have questions out here. Okay, sure. We can have a drink. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the very interesting questions. <laughs>